fascinating conversation happening here between the studio and the control room about the word folks, but not spelled the way that you might think it's spelled, the way that I think it's spelled, F-O-L-K-S, folks. Like, hey, folks, what you doing? No, no. The left, the woke left has a new way to spell this word. Apparently, they now spell it F-O-L-X, folks. And it's supposed to be this gender-inclusive way of spelling this word. This this New York Times HR executive used it specifically. This is why we were talking about it here in the studio. Used it to talk to LGBTQ employees at the New York Times. She addressed them on a Slack channel as folks, F-O-L-K, or F-O-L-X. And I was like, what the heck is this? What does this even mean? And the reason that I had this question, not just, it's not as stupid as like Latinx or women when you X out the woman, because while I think that that's stupid and insane, I understand what they're doing with the woman. They're trying to not make it woman. They're trying to get rid of the man from woman. But this, with folks, I was like, well, K-S, F-O-L-K-S. K-S is not gendered to my knowledge. So what on earth does F-O-L-X mean? Why would they change that? So apparently, (laughs) I just looked it up. Apparently, it is because X is in algebra. Yes, there's math in this. There's math in this. X in algebra is the unknown variable, right? So if you put X in folks, then you have to solve for the unknown variable. And it's supposed to represent uh, people who do not identify as within the gender binary. And it is supposed to represent purposeful inclusion of transgender people in your speech. (laughs) Um, This is so relevant to the show and not just something that we were talking about for fun in the studio before we got started today. So F-O-L... X is the word of the day. You might see a conundrum here because we are told on one hand that math, mathematics, is uh, racist, that it perpetuates white supremacy. That's what universities across the country tell white people. They tell um, they tell black people that they don't have to get good grades on, on a math quiz, on a math exam, on a math test because... Math is just white supremacy. On the other hand, it seems to me that if you don't know your algebra, you can't solve for the unknown equation, and maybe that makes you transphobic. So a little conundrum for our queer theorist friends here as we get started on the show. Um, Bud Light's stock price dropped 3%, which is a humongous amount for a company of that size. And this happened, of course, after Bud Light partnered with transgender TikTok star Dylan Mulvaney. And here's what I will have to say. This is not go woke, go broke, what we're seeing happen here. Bud Light's going to be fine. Budweiser, owned by Anheuser-Busch, which is owned by another, another company at this point. This is not going to teach Bud Light a lesson. But there is a crazy reason that Bud Light made the decision that they did to partner with Dylan Mulvaney, knowing that their primary consumer is like a working class, middle of the country, red-blooded, patriotic, oftentimes Christian American who is not going to relate to transgender TikTok star Dylan Mulvaney, who's pretending that he's a woman. The reason behind why Bud Light made this decision, that's what we're going to talk about today. So let's get to it. Guys, you have to get four patriots. China already screwed us over once with COVID. I do not want this to happen again. The Chinese Communist Party right now is hoarding massive amounts of food. I'm talking over two thirds of the globe's corn reserves, over half of its rice and over half of its wheat. This is a ton of food. But when they're asked about it, the Chinese Communist Party just lies. Why? Because China thinks that we are on the verge of a global food shortage. And China is the world's number one food importer. They rely on the rest of the world. They rely on us to keep their people fed so they can't afford to mess up or imagine what's gonna happen. There are gonna be riots in the streets, civil panic, maybe even worse, when their people, over a billion people, can't eat. So what does this mean for you? What does it mean for me? Two words, food shortages. They are coming. That's why you must stock up on Four Patriots Survival Food. I highly recommend you begin your own stockpile of Four Patriots Survival Food kits. The kits are compact and stack easily. They're very easy to store. They have different breakfasts, lunches, dinners. And right now, you can get 10% off your first purchase of Four Patriots Survival Food if you use my promo code, Liz, at checkout. Just go to fourpatriots.com, use code Liz to get 10% off your first purchase of Four Patriots Survival Food. That's fourpatriots.com, promo code Liz. Fourpatriots.com, promo code Liz. Okay, we talked about this briefly last week. Bud Light partnered with Dylan Mulvaney, this Days of Girlhood star um, from TikTok, who is a man, claims that he is a woman, has gone wildly viral because the political left 
has exploited him and made him into the poster child of queer theory, the poster child of transgenderism. So very sad story about this young man who has mutilated his body and you know his, his identity as a man just to be famous, but the left has exploited him in a, in a grotesque manner here. Last week, we talked about the fact that Bud Light not only partnered with Dylan Mulvaney, made him a sponsor of, of Bud Light, you can go to the TikTok channel or the TikTok or Instagram of Dylan Mulvaney and you can see the video that he made. They also sent him a specially printed can, a commemorative can of beer with his face. He's obviously dressed like a woman in woman face with his face on this beer can as part of the incentive for Dylan Mulvaney to advertise Budweiser. And you and I and a lot of people like us across the country didn't take to this too well. We are offended by Dylan Mulvaney because he's acting in a way intended to destroy objective truth. I feel bad for him as an individual. I I worry about his soul. I find it to be heartbreaking what he's doing to his body. And he always refers to the mental health issues that he's suffering from, which we'll talk about in just a second. But the stock price of Budweiser in the wake of this partnership with Dylan Mulvaney plunged by 3% on Monday of this week, which is a large drop for a company as big as Budweiser, which is relatively stable. Now they claim, oh, you know, this is still a 50 year high for us, which it may be, but it's ridiculous to try to insinuate that the 3% drop that they have experienced in the last couple of days has nothing to do with their partnership that was all over the news last week with Dylan Mulvaney. Of course it does. Don't try to gaslight us. It obviously has to do with Dylan Mulvaney, which should show you in a, in a perfectly free market, uncorrupted by, you know, ESG, in a perfectly free market, this would be a sign to Budweiser that they should not be partnering with Dylan Mulvaney, that they should try to appeal to their consumer instead of acting like they hate the people that buy their product, which is what they're acting like when they when they trot out Dylan Mulvaney as their spokesperson. But all of this being said, it's a huge amount of stock price to drop and it's not gonna make any difference in Budweiser's choices of how they advertise. It's not going to do a darn thing. Nothing. They're not going to listen to the market. They're not going to listen to the consumer. It doesn't matter how much their stock price drops because we are not operating anymore in a perfectly free market system. Our capitalist system has been perverted by ESG, the environmental, social, and governance metrics that big banks like BlackRock, Bank of America use to control businesses, business decisions. So Budweiser, instead of saying, well, we shouldn't do something stupid that's going to cause our consumers to be mad because out of respect for our um, shareholders, we have to make sure that we make financially, fiscally responsible decisions. No, no. Now they look at their ESG score. They look at maybe the category, the S, the social category. Are they properly virtue signaling? Are they pushing for radical leftist political agenda items? And that's how they base their business decisions. And in this case, it's it's not just hypothetical, like I just described. I, I, I explained this for anybody who doesn't know what ESG is. If you listen to the show, we talk about it all the time. You should know what it is. But ESG in general is not actually the only reason that Budweiser made this decision. There's another index, another social credit score system called CEI. It stands for Corporate Equality Index. It is a specific version of ESG is what I'd call it. Because ESG, there are about, I don't know, 100 different ESG calculators or ESG metric systems. ESG is a generalized concept. The the World Economic Forum and Klaus Schwab are trying to make their version of ESG the universal one. But right now there's a bunch of, ironically, competing ESG metrics and standards. And so there's, there's tons of them. One of these specific ones is called CEI, this Corporate Equality Index. And what is the Corporate Equality Index and how does it impact Budweiser? The Corporate Equality Index is dedicated specifically to the um, transgenderism political agenda. They claim that they want LGBTQIA representation and inclusion and rights, et cetera, et cetera, in corporate workplaces. But the truth of the matter is they are using transgenderism as their political cause. But it's just that. It's not, it's not, it's not, um, it's not transgenderism with abortion, it's not transgenderism with climate change. They're they're just dedicated to transgenderism. So the corporate equality index is um 
an organization that is funded and, you know, cue the alarm bells here because the left will tell us it's anti-Semitic to even mention his name, let alone his political activism. The Corporate Equality Index is funded by George Soros. That's right, George Soros and his Open Society Foundation gave millions and millions of dollars to the Corporate Equality Index, which isn't going to surprise you. Of course it's not, because we know how extremely influential George Soros is using his money for political activism, which is why we are perfectly free to talk about it. It's not immoral, it's not anti-Semitic. Of course we can talk about any individual and their political activism. We can support it, we can oppose it, based on the activism itself and the impacts of that activism, and that has nothing to do with the religious beliefs or the heritage of the individual who is pursuing that activism. So the Corporate Equality Index is funded by George Soros, and this is what the New York Post writes about the process of the Corporate Equality Index, how, how this, this Corporate Equality Index holds businesses and corporations absolutely hostage. We're gonna talk about that in just a second, but first I wanna talk to you about Genucel. Ladies and gentlemen, there are a lot of skincare products out there, so let me cut right to the chase and tell you about the one I like the best. It's called Genucel. Sure, you can go to Brazil or Colombia and get crazy stuff done to your face, but please don't. Why on earth would you do that? when you have Genucel. Let me read to you what a woman named Claire wrote to me about Genucel. She said, I absolutely love Genucel. My skin feels so good, tighter, younger, with a more even tone, and I only used it for a week. My advice to everyone, she says, is take a before picture. It's true. Genucel is a family recipe made by compounding pharmacists in small batches. It's always safe, it's cruelty-free, and it's natural. I got you a great deal if you want to try this. Right now, go to genucel.com slash Liz, and you can save over 70% off Genucel's most popular package, which features their ultra retinol and dark spot corrector. Don't wait. Go to genucel.com slash Liz. That's genucel.com slash Liz. All orders are upgraded to free shipping, and every subscription order includes a complimentary spring spa box with three spa essentials also free. Genucel.com slash Liz. That's G-E-N-U-C-E-L dot com slash Liz. Visit now, Genucel.com slash Liz. So according to the New York Post, this is how the Corporate Equality Index, which is funded by George Soros, holds corporations essentially hostage to their radical transgender political agenda. The Post writes, businesses that attain the maximum 100 total points earn the coveted title of best place to work for LGBTQ equality. 15 of the top 20 Fortune ranked companies received 100% ratings last year, this according to HRC, the Human Rights Campaign. More than 840 US companies racked up high CEI, Corporate Equality Index scores, according to the latest report. The Human Rights Campaign, which was formed in 1980 and started the Corporate Equality Index in 2002, well, well, look what we have there, is led by Kelly Robinson, who was named as president in 2022 and worked as a political organizer for Barack Obama, Barack Obama's 2008 presidential campaign. Oh, okay, so the Human Rights Campaign started the Corporate Equality Index. It is now funded by George Soros and his Open Society Foundation, and it's run by a, a former political organizer for Barack Obama. Can we just pause here for a moment and talk about Barack Obama? I feel like Barack Obama does not get the credit he deserves as the radical that he is. When in 2008, very few people were talking about Marxism the way that we're talking about uh, cultural Marxism, especially now. Very few people were talking about, oh, critical race theory. We hadn't even heard of critical race theory in 2008. But very few people were, were identifying a cultural phenomenon and tracing it back to its Marxist roots, which is extremely important to do now, since that's the number one threat we're facing in our country. No one was saying, oh, queer theory, trace it back to its neo-Marxist roots, right? This, this, this document written by Gail Rubin, who is a, is a neo-Marxist, writing about how to exploit transgender people, tell them they're so marginalized that their only recourse, their only way to be included in society is to overthrow their white, Christian, straight, quote unquote, cis oppressors. We weren't talking about that back in 2008. And Barack Obama, and this was a mistake, by the way, because Barack Obama was one of these radicals. He is one of these radicals. We just didn't notice it. We didn't notice it. The only person who noticed this was Andrew Breitbart. 
at the time, during Barack Obama's uh, tenure as president, Andrew Breitbart released a video of Barack Obama from Obama's college years. And in this video of Barack Obama, Barack Obama was defending a man by the name of Derek Bell. I remember watching this video at the time, and I remember buying Derek Bell's books after this because Andrew Breitbart, at the time, he was the savage, the based conservative leader. I was a young conservative, and I thought, okay, if Andrew Breitbart thinks it's important, he thinks it's a news story, a bombshell revelation that Barack Obama's defending Derek Bell, I wanna understand this. I don't wanna just take his word for it. I wanna understand who Derek Bell is. So I bought Derek Bell's books. I think I actually still have them on a bookshelf in my basement. And Derek Bell, is one of the founding members of critical race theory. Derek Bell is one of the biggest propagators of this neo-Marxist racial superiority, racial inferiority ideology that has poisoned our country. And when he was in college, Barack Obama was on video defending him. If that happened now, if we came up with a video of Joe Biden doing the same thing, it would be the end of Joe Biden's political career, at least among certainly Republicans and conservatives, but centrists and independents and rational-minded Democrats, maybe who have children in public schools who've seen the evils of critical race theory. Back then, it didn't, I mean, it obviously didn't out impact the outcome of either election. I don't think people really grasped at the time, even Republicans didn't grasp at the time, the depth to which cultural Marxism, these neo-Marxist theories had been embedded in our country and how many politicians had been poisoned by this, who were essentially secret radicals. I know that sounds conspiratorial, but now it's just objectively, it's easy to see the objective reality of the thing. So back, back to now, back to modern day. Maybe it's less of a surprise then that the human rights campaign, which started the Corporate Equality Index, which is a radical transgenderism um, active, I call it an activist organization, but essentially what they're doing is just holding corporations hostage. It's actually like a mafia operation forcing this radical neo-Marxist theory into workplaces across the country, into the largest corporations in our nation. And it's run by a former community organizer, political organizer of Barack Obama. Every single factor of this program is the biggest red flag possible and should cause every company to run the opposite direction. So what the Corporate Equality Index measures when they are me when they're rating or ranking a company on this index, they measure five things. They measure workforce protections for LGBTQ people, inclusive benefits, supporting an inclusive culture, corporate social responsibility and responsible citizenship. So work, workforce protections, inclusive benefits, supporting an inclusive culture, those are all pretty self-explanatory. But what exactly is corporate social responsibility and responsible citizenship? This means that not only do you have to have a tolerant workplace, not only do you have to provide benefits if you have an employee that you know is gay married to a person of the same sex, that's, that's not what they're talking about. They're not talking about things internally at your workplace. Corporate social responsibility and responsible citizenship means you are ranked as a company, as a corporation, on your political activism, on whether you not just passively include LGBTQ people in your workplace and provide benefits for them, but whether you take part in the revolution of transgenderism that has nothing to do with your business outside of your corporate workplace. So if a corporation is not actively virtue signaling to the world, using their money and their influence as the biggest company, one of some of the biggest companies, not only in our country, but in the world to push this ideology, you will be downgraded on the corporate equality index. It's like the perfect mafia, hostage-taking shakedown. These companies are scared of having low corporate equality index. I don't understand why these companies don't just group together and say, let's collectively agree that we should you know, flush ESG down the toilet. Let's just ignore these. Who cares if we get a bad rating? But they don't. They are held hostage. The corporate equality index and the human rights campaign actively sends representatives to corporations and big companies if they are not adequately scoring, scoring high enough on these indexes. So if you are not engaging in political activism as a company outside of your workplace, 
in a way that satisfies this radical transgenderism agenda, they're gonna actually send someone knock, knock, knock at your door. It's a threat. It's actually a mafia shakedown. If you don't do what we say, we're not gonna protect you from the political pressure and the media pressure and the cultural pressure. And we're gonna make sure that the political sphere and the media and the culture knows that you are unfriendly to our pet cause. It is a shakedown. So now you understand why Budweiser partnered with Dylan Mulvaney, because this is part of their corporate social responsibility, their responsible citizenship, if they don't actively promote transgenderism, actively promote queer theory, then they're downgraded. This is how deeply embedded into our culture ESG already is. We talk about ESG in this very zoomed out way a lot. Oh, we talk about it like Klaus Schwab and the World Economic Forum and BlackRock and Bank of America and what they wanna do. They wanna make it universal. They wanna control us through a central bank digital currency, which by the way, we're gonna talk about uh, later this week. They, we talk about it in this large way because it's that's scary and it's real and it's coming and we need to put a stop to it. And we forget that microcosms of this system are already here and already impacting businesses and business decisions and their promotion of things that we as consumers or former consumers of this product find abhorrent. That's why it doesn't matter that the 3%, the, the stock price of Budweiser fell by 3%, it doesn't matter. They're not gonna make a different decision. They don't care about us. They hate us for one thing, but even if they, even if they didn't hate us, it's not gonna change their business decision because they care more about their ESG score. They care more about the corporate equality index score that they're going to get. They care more about avoiding the political and media bullying, the cultural onslaught they'll face if the human rights campaign starts to make accusations that they aren't an adequately LGBTQ friendly workplace environment, they can't tolerate it. ESG is one, and I feel bad by the way for Dylan Mulvaney. Dylan Mulvaney posts often on his Instagram, I follow his Instagram, and he posts often about having a hard, a hard week or a hard day. He talks about the mental health struggles that he has. And this makes me really, really sad for a couple of reasons, which we're gonna talk about in just a second. But first I wanna to talk to you about the Attorneys on Retainer program. It's a new self-defense plan for gun owners that was created by Arizona criminal defense attorney, Mark Victor, and administered by his law firm, the Attorneys for Freedom. If you are a responsible gun owner, you may already have CCW insurance or have heard of these gun insurance plans. What you may not know is if the insurance company says the shooting was not justified as self-defense and you were convicted of a crime, the insurance company will not only drop your coverage, which is bad enough, but you may be required to reimburse them. I don't know about you, but as a responsible gun owner myself, I would not want to trust my self-defense shooting to an insurance company. I'd rather have the Attorneys for Freedom's experienced and aggressive criminal defense team on retainer 24-7. If you are a gun owner and you want the legal defense without the endless exclusions of an insurance company, join the Attorneys on Retainer Self-Protection Program. Visit attorneysforfreedom.com slash Liz. And enter my promo code, Liz25, to receive $25 off your sign-up. That's attorneysforfreedom.com slash Liz. Promo code, Liz25. Attorneysforfreedom.com slash Liz. Promo code, Liz25. So, Dylan Mulvaney recently posted after um, the Nike promotion that he did. Nike has also jumped onto this. He's, he's wearing a sports bra and promoting Nike, Nike athleisure wear, pretending to work out, I guess, as well as this Budweiser thing. And he's obviously faced pretty strong backlash, not because we have anything against him as a person, but because his political activism is representative of queer theory, which is a inherently violent, dangerous, neo-Marxist revolutionary ideology. What have I been saying over and over about queer theory? I'm gonna say it until you guys are all repeating this. We're all repeating this in our sleep until our whole country understands what we're facing here. And it makes me sad for Dylan Mulvaney because part of queer theory is using these people, these, these, these queer identifying people, these people suffering from gender disorders as pawns. And that's exactly what Budweiser is doing to Dylan Mulvaney. They're using him as a pawn. They're exacerbating his pain and suffering uh, by subjecting him 
to this righteous indignation that we feel when we see women attacked, we see reality attacked, when we see this, this queer theory transgenderism infiltrating our society. We feel righteous indignation. We're going to criticize the people who are doing that. The people who are the person, in this case, who is the poster child for that, Dylan Mulvaney, is being taken advantage of by Budweiser and by the human rights campaign. And it makes me sad that someone would do that. But it also shows us exactly how exploitative queer theory is. Some of you ask for a much shorter version of how we as a society should view the tra view transgenderism. And so... I'll do the best I can to offer a shorter version of this. When we see the transgender ideology, we need to understand that the transgender ideology is are just, it's the principles of queer theory. Queer theory is the ideological underpinning and the transgenderism, neo-pronouns, the gender spectrum is the, is the outgrowth of it. It's the manifestation, it's the blossom coming from the root of queer theory. And queer theory is Marxist. It is a neo-Marxist ideology which positions one group LGBTQ people as marginalized, and another group, straight, white, quote-unquote, cis Christians, mostly men, as oppressors. And the purpose of any neo-Marxist ideology is to start a revolution. It is to start a Marxist revolution, and that's why they pit the oppressed against the oppressors. They are hoping for a literal revolt of the oppressed group against the oppressors. This is what queer theory is. So when we think of the transgender ideology, we absolutely should think of the children who are being mutilated, their bodies are being destroyed, their fertility is ruined. We should think of them. We should think of the trans surgeries and we should protect those individual bodies. We should also think of the people, the adolescents, the young adults, sometimes middle-aged folks who, and this is F-O-L-K-S, who regret being transitioned when they were young. We should think about that regret. We should think about those detransitioners. We should, that's who we should think about when we think the transgender ideology. We should think about schools that are hiding transitions, quote unquote, transitions from parents. We should think about parental rights. We should think about how puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones and surgeries are not curative for gender disorders. They're not curative for anything related to gender dysphoria. Gender identity is an ideology. It's not, it's not, it's not a medication. It's not a treatment plan. It's not an illness. It's not a therapy. It's none of that. It's, it's just politics. It's Marxism. We should think about doctors being complicit in this, doing harm when they have sworn to do no harm. We should think about TikTok indoctrinating in schools abusing, but we should also think about the Marxism. We should also think about this dialectic, this oppressed class, so-called oppressed class, these people that are told that they're marginalized and being told that their lives are at risk, that they're on the verge of facing genocide, that, that they're not safe because they're told that this other group of people, straight, white, quote unquote, cis Christians, have oppressed them. We have to think about this. Because the ultimate outcome is a Marxist revolution if we don't stop queer theory the way that we have stopped critical race theory. This is what ESG is about too, right? This is, this is it, it, both of these things, ESG, and queer theory sound like a conspiracy theory, and it's because they are a conspiracy. Conspiracies are real, as we talked about in that conspiracy theory episode a couple of weeks ago. Conspiracies can be real. Conspiracy theories are, you know, not real. They are a fabrication. They're someone's fiction. But these are, of course, ESG is a conspiracy. Of course, queer theory is a conspiracy. They're Marxist conspiracies to ultimately, fundamentally transform the United States of America into a Marxist nation. We have to think of this when we think of queer theory. I also want to talk about Taylor Swift broke up with her boyfriend. They were dating for six years and they announced, well, I guess they didn't announce, but people, um, people found out that they had broken up. Taylor Swift and her boyfriend, Joe, had broken up. And the reason for this breakup, I'd like to discuss the reason for this breakup. I read about this on the Daily Mail. The reason for their breakup is Taylor Swift's superstar persona. Her superstar persona which is the most hilarious phrase that I can think of. So essentially what it means, what this phrase means, superstar persona, it means that she's a diva, that she's a brat, that she's selfish, and that it sabotaged the relationship as you might imagine that it would. And you might be saying, Liz, I don't care about this at all. I don't care about celebrity breakups, but uh, oh yes, you do. Let me tell you why. So 
Taylor Swift is an example of what happens to young women when they buy into radical leftist narratives about uh, gender and sex. Taylor Swift, when I was in high school, we're about the same age, Taylor Swift and I. When I was in high school, Taylor Swift was one of my favorite singers. I was not a huge follower of pop culture. You guys know I was homeschooled. But Taylor Swift's songs were my favorite because they were so relatable. Everything that she was going through, being having her first crush, going on a, going to a school dance together, going on a first date, that that um, first breakup, dreaming about you know a fairy tale wedding and a prince charming. She was so skilled and so talented. There's a reason she's a world famous superstar, right? Because girls my age, all around the world, Taylor Swift vocalized what we were all going through, and this this is true across cultures. Young women inherently desire to fall in love, to have that true love, to have that Prince Charming, to get married, to have babies happily ever after. They um, think about this from the time that they're very little, very small, and every boy that they have a crush on, girls in their mind, and I know this is gonna freak the men out who watch this show, but let me just tell you an objective truth. Girls think about whether or not every man that they have a crush on or go on a date with is a suitable mate? Is this the one? Is this my Prince Charming? Even if they're not trying to get married right now, even if they're not putting pressure on that man, they think about it. That's how girls are inherently wired. And Taylor Swift vocalized that in all her music. And it was great until all of a sudden her music changed a little bit. All of a sudden her music didn't represent how girls are inherently made. It started representing what she had been told her socialization, if you will, her liberal politics. Well, maybe liberal politics started getting into her mind and then it started seeping into her music. And so Taylor Swift, what she should have done in her life is she should have kept writing music about every stage of life that she was in as she progressed through life. So she should have written about these crushes and these breakups and college boyfriends and adventures. And then she should have written about Um, relationships when she actually did meet the one and dating and engagement and marriage and babies and motherhood. And she would have been the most famous singer probably in the history of our country. And she would have had a fan base that lived life with her from now until death. It would have been like we've never seen before. But that's not what happened. What happened instead is she fell prey to leftism. She fell prey to feminism. She fell prey to the politics of the left, the politics of the Democratic Party. She's actually active politically. She was um, posting, she lives in Nashville, Tennessee, and she was posting against Marsha Blackburn. She was posting against pro-life issues. She was posting in favor of abortion. She actually put abortion activism in her, I think it was a Netflix documentary that was that was so famous. And Taylor Swift com- completely ruined herself. She was her persona and really who she was. I don't know her in private, so I can't say that this happened to her in private, but by all appearances, she was also personally ruined by this. She fell prey to the idea that women shouldn't get married young, they don't need marriage, that um, that that sex is just with the person that you want, That um, and she started living the way that feminists tell women that they find empowerment. Feminists tell women they find empowerment with just gratuitous sex, this quote unquote agency over your body that comes with sleeping with as many people as you want, unencumbered by the bonds of marriage and no children. And look at what's happened. Look at what's happened. She's now 33 years old. She is single. She doesn't have children and she never appears to be happy like she used to be. Interestingly, the contrast to this is my generation is perhaps going to be the last generation that fully falls prey to the feminist narrative that tells women that it's beneath us to be wives, it's beneath us to be mothers, and that we find our true fulfillment and true value in the amount of money that's in our paycheck going into the workforce. It seems that Gen Z is beginning to reject this, which is fascinating to me because Gen Z is not exactly a religious generation, right? They might be the least religious generation of any generation in... American history, the least religious, I think one in five Gen Zers identify as queer. This is astronomical numbers. But Gen Zers have latched on to a very interesting trend on TikTok called trad wife. The trad wife trend is essentially what it sounds like, where these young Gen Z women, by the way, devoid of religion, this is not, this is not a religious movement, have recognized that 
going into the workforce and working 40 hours a week at a job that may or may not have any meaning just for a paycheck so that you can claim to have equality with a man is not something that makes them happy. That what they truly desire innately, what does make them happy is being uh, a wife, a homemaker, and a mother. And this video, I'm gonna show you a video from TikTok of uh, the girl who really started the trad wife, or started making these videos go viral. I should say she didn't start the trad wife uh, movement, but this is how she describes it. Take a look at this. Okay, so I'm here to make a clarification video because of the big controversy going around about the term trad wife and the intent behind the term, as well as the intent behind my channel and what I post. If you are not familiar with the term trad wife, it is a woman who chooses to live a more traditional life with ultra traditional gender roles. So the man goes outside the house, works, provides for the family. The woman stays home and she's the homemaker. She takes care of the home and the children if there are any. The misconception about the trad wife movement, um, it's not really a movement, nobody's pushing it. People are typically just living it and maybe showcasing their lifestyle like me. And we believe our place, specifically us as individuals, believe our purpose is to be homemakers. It doesn't mean that we are trying to take away what women fought for. There are a lot of people trying to make this a sinister thing or put some other darker meaning behind the term trad wife. Nobody is doing that. No trad wife TikTokers are saying every woman's place is in their home. We as individuals are just choosing to be homemakers. That's all. Okay, so what's really interesting about that video is it showcases one of the biggest flaws of feminism. Feminism at first, or at least how people understand feminism, this actually isn't how feminism originally was, but how people understand feminism is that feminism is just fighting for women's right to have a job, to be in the workplace, fighting for women's choice um, to be either at home with their families or in the workplace. This is, this is how most people understand quote unquote original feminism. That's actually not true. Original feminism was never about women's choice. Original feminism was always degrading women who stayed home, women who were wives, women who uh, raised their children, had children and stayed at home, rearing them and caring for them and loving them. That original feminism was never actually about choice. It actually was about just getting women to the workplace. And it's interesting. I find Gen Z to be a fascinating generation because while they're the least religious generation, they uh, one in five Gen Zers identify as queer, or some astronomical number like that, they're also recognizing several generations removed from the feminist movement. They're recognizing that the promises that feminists have made to young women aren't true. That feminists told women that they would find fulfillment and empowerment in being promiscuous and having multiple partners and not being committed and not being married. And that their true value, they were wasting their potential when they were having babies and staying home with their children versus being in the workplace. And Sadly, people like Taylor Swift, I think is a good example of this, are finding that this pr promise that feminists have propagated isn't true. Their lives are, are turning up empty. They're not happy. They're, everything's falling apart around them. And Gen Z is starting to recognize, not because of, of religious beliefs, not because of faith-oriented um, values, but just through practical experience that feminism is a total crock. Feminism is a total crock. And on top of this, there is a girl um, by the name of Millie Bobby Brown. She's an actress who stars in Stranger Things. I don't know if you guys have seen that show or not. Um, not my thing, but I am familiar with this, with this actress. She announced her engagement on Instagram this week. You can see this here on the screen. She announced it, showed a picture of herself and her fiance and her engagement ring and, you know, said, I've loved, I've loved you three summers now, honey. I want them all with a heart, which is sweet. But instead of being happy for her, people are criticizing her. They're saying she's only 19. This actress is 19 years old, in fact. She is young, she's much younger than the traditional, not the traditional, but the, uh, the average age that women get married now in the United States. And so instead of being happy for her, there's a trend. If you go on Twitter right now, it's actually trending close to the top five trends in the United States, she's 19 in a derogatory way. So as feminists praise people like Taylor Swift, who at 33 years old don't have any children, don't have any relationship, commitment, spouse, marriage, family, they're criticizing this young girl who recognizes that what she wants to do is love this one man for the rest of her life. 
This is how messed up the radical left is. How absolutely messed up. So funny story, I clicked on this trend. She's 19 on Twitter to, to see what it was all about. This is how I learned about uh, Millie Bobby Brown announcing her engagement and the left essentially and feminists. Other women actually degrading her for getting engaged. And to my surprise, imagine my surprise when I scroll down uh, on just three posts on this on this tr- uh, thread, on this trending list, is a video of me. A video of me. An old video of me from six or seven years ago. This has nothing to do with Millie Bobby Brown, but the caption of this video, someone had posted this video and said, she's 19 about me. And I thought you guys would get a kick out of this like I did. This is the video that they posted. After transgender and transracial, we got transabled. Yeah, this one's really messed up. Physically healthy people who feel they should have been born disabled. A man in Great Britain cut off his arm because he felt like an amputee. A woman in North Carolina poured drain cleaner in her eyes because she felt blind. Transgender, transracial, transabled. Guess what's next? A grown man posting an ad on Craigslist wanting a nanny because he identifies as a baby. You can't make this stuff up. Ridiculous? Perhaps, but who's to say anymore if that's how he feels? If a man can be a woman because he feels like one, if a white person can be a black person because she feels like one, if a healthy person can mutilate herself because she feels disabled, if a grown man can be a baby because he feels infantile, where does this end? Can a child be an adult because she feels like a grown up? Can a teenager buy alcohol because he identifies as over 21 years of age? Can a grown man attend kindergarten because he identifies as a six year old girl? Can a child spend the day at doggy daycare instead of school because the child feels like a canine? If not, why not? If a kid can be transgender because he feels like a girl, who are we to tell a child he must attend school or obey his parents or refuse him a beer when he orders one? You can't have it both ways. So what's funny about that video is I was trying to figure out what year that was from. I was trying to get a glimpse of my left hand because I thought I'd be able to tell if it was 2016 or 2017. I think it's either 2016 or 2017, but I got engaged at the end of 2016. I thought, uh, I was trying to see if I could if I could spot an engagement ring so I could identify when that was filmed. But I was not gesturing very heavily that day and I could not tell, but it's either 2016 or 2017. And what's funny is I remember filming that video because there was a crew member that day in the studio that thought what I was saying was so outrageous, thought that what I was saying was so hyperbolic and so offensive. Um, By the way, I love this crew member, still friends to this day. So I say this, I I say this lovingly. Uh, I was totally right about this. Seven years later, and that video was exposing not the slippery slope in the fallacy sense, but exposing what was going to happen if we accepted transgenderism. And this was right at the outset of transgenderism in our culture. It wasn't even a widely understood or widely known thing. It wasn't the political movement that it is today. And I was demonstrating exactly what kind of insanity would flow if we allowed reality to be redefined by neo-Marxist theories. And I gotta say, man, did I nail that. I was right on the money. and. It truly brings me only a tiny bit of joy to say that. It's always nice to, uh, <laughs> it's always nice when your analysis is accurate, but what it's done to our country is certainly, that certainly brings me no joy. But that was what, that was what was trending. Got like a million views or something in the She's 19 trend on Twitter, which is completely random and funny. Uh, the moral of this story today is that we actually have an opportunity here. We have an opportunity because when it comes to transgenderism, similar to the word woke, People know that it's wrong. People know that it's bad. People know that they don't want it. They don't want their children indoctrinated with it. Not everyone can define the word woke in an academic sense, just like not everyone can define the transgender ideology to be queer theory. They can't necessarily define queer theory to be the neo-Marxist ideology, revolutionary, violent ideology that it is, but they feel it. They know it's wrong. They know it's bad. They know it's something that shouldn't be allowed in our nation. And the only reason that they stay quiet about it is because the other side bullies them by falsely accusing them of being transphobic and bigoted and hateful and all of the rest of the insults that the left hurls at us. So we have an opportunity here. There are a lot of people in this country who are only quiet because they're afraid, but all they need is the information or the informational ammunition to be able to take queer theory down, to be able to expose it as the hideous, poisonous, violent ideology that it is, we must until the entire country knows. 
Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. I'm Liz Wheeler. This is The Liz Wheeler Show. If you haven't already, give this video a thumbs up, hit the subscribe button below, and ring the bell to make sure you never miss a video.